And now the pressing question comes upon me from, from all quarters, as I knew it would. Martin, what is the significance of the line in the Flintstones theme song when uh, it says, let's ride with the family down the street through the courtesy of Fred's two feet? People said, Martin, we're thankful that you've brought this lyric to our cognizance, but now you need to explain it. Well, it's simply this. The Flintstone cars, if you want to call them that, were not powered by a internal combustion engine, which, of course, I would admire that. I would like that. I would like to live in the Flintstone era, and I would like to live in bedrock. I w that would be a happy place where there are stone pots stone jug, stone silverware, quote, silverware, and I would be happy with the thud rather than the clink of kitchen utensils. I would also be happy with this feet-powered car. That's right, Fred powered his car and Barney too with their feet. You remember their feet stuck out from under their cars and they did the twinkle toes thing for a second, and then off they went running. And that is why we travel with the family down the street through the courtesy of Fred's two feet. Not his internal combustion engine, no, ladies and gentlemen, but his two feet. I hope that uh, yesterday I destroyed the doctrine of the Trinity because it keeps people, and I'm telling you this because I have an urge, an impulse, a compulsion to give you details about Paul's gospel before the crescendo of this Revelation series. I doubt I will do this again before the end of the Revelation series. It could be I will, but I feel that this is this is my last presentation of Paul's gospel and the things standing in the way of Paul's gospel. Paul's gospel, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, concerns the death for sin and the entombment and the resurrection of of Jesus Christ. And just when you think that sounds so simple, you realize that Satan has ingeniously constructed tripwires in front of every essential element of that gospel, beginning with Christ died. Yesterday, I covered that for you. How does Satan get millions of people to think that they believe in the death of Christ, but actually they don't believe in the death of Christ? That is diabolical genius, and it is accomplished via the Trinity, which says that Jesus Christ is God. And it's so attractive because people think they're doing Jesus Christ a favor. They think they're enhancing Jesus Christ's resume, where in fact, they're slapping Jesus Christ in the face, saying, you don't know who you are. We know who you are. Stop saying you're the Son of God. We know you're God himself. Stop saying the Father is greater than you, because you are the Father. And when we talk to Jesus this way, we assume he's an idiot, and he's not impressed. No, with that assumption, he's not. He's clearly the Son of God, and he died. Now, it's essential to know that because we're saved by Jesus Christ's faith. Where is his faith in his Father to raise him from the ultimate enemy? That, that's our enemy. Remember, we're not saved from eternal torment because there's no such thing as that. It's a theological fiction. We're saved from death. How does Jesus Christ save us from death? He goes into the death state, and he raises from the dead. That's not just the icing on the cake, folks. That's the cake. That's the whole cake resurrection. And we discredit the resurrection. We make it of none effect when we have no death before it. There can be no resurrection unless there's death. So resurrection just becomes some fictitious little halfway house or where you you're you're promoted from a halfway house either from purgatory in the catholic fictional world the cash the catholic fantasy or from uh limbo if you're a baby the babies go to limbo who the heck invented that I don't know And of course if you're a regular christian you have your immortality of the soul a pagan philosophical lie, a satanic lie. That was Satan's first lie, you shall not surely die. And it's promoted today as essential truth by the Christian religion. The Trinity is essential truth for you to be a Christian. Belief in the immortality of the soul, that is that you never die, you either go to heaven or hell after you, quote, die, unquote. That's religious fiction passed on to you by the Christian religion. And they, they say you have to believe these things to be a Christian. And indeed, that's true. That's why 
being a Christian is the worst thing you can be. Do not become a Christian. I'm not a Christian. Jesus was not a Christian. Christianity is a man-made religion begun in the 4th century AD by Constantine, who declared Christianity to be the official government of the, the official religion of the state. Yeah, state-sponsored religion. If that rubs you wrong, then you have good spiritual sensitivity. If you can't wait to join the most popular organization on the planet, namely Christianity, then you are spiritually numb, you have no spiritual instincts whatsoever, and you just want to belong to the most popular religion. That's it. If the people today who belong to Christianity were born in Saudi Arabia, they would be Muslims. See, they think they're believing in Christianity because they love Jesus. He just, no, they, Jesus just happens to be the head of the most popular religion in the place where they live, which is the United States. So all they want is the most popular thing, the thing that's going to cause them to be accepted and belong to the club. And that religion in this area of the world happens to be Christianity. So it's no affinity for Jesus Christ because they don't know Jesus Christ. They know the fake Jesus, but they don't know him. So if these same people who merely have a mainstream mindset were born in Saudi Arabia, Arabia, they would be Muslims because that's the prevailing wind. And these people go with the prevailing wind. That's their love. It's their heart's desire to go with the prevailing wind. They don't, care who, they, don't give a, they don't give a damn who the God is behind it. They'll happily believe in Allah, just whatever is prevailing. That's what they'll do. If they're born in India, they will be... Uh, they will be... Not Muslims, but the, what, what, what the heck are you? In? Buddhists. Uh, yeah, they will be Buddhists. If they're born in China, whatever, they will be Buddhists. No, they'll be Hindus. Yeah, that's what they'll be. If they're born in, uh, born in India, they'll be Hindus because that's the prevailing religion. If they're born in China, they'll be Buddhists because that's the prevailing religion. So it's not a Christ thing. Christ just happens to be the false deity in charge of the false religion Christianity, which dominates in the West. So it, it, it's not a desire for God. It's not a desire to know God, to know Christ, because I'm telling you, even if you lived in Saudi Arabia or India or China, if you had a desire for God, God would lead you to Christ. People get upset when I say Christ is the only way to salvation. Sorry, but he is. He's the only way to salvation. So they think that by me saying that, I'm eliminating Buddhists and Muslims and Hindus from ever being saved. <laughs> that's, a, that's a false conclusion. You see, because I contend that the Buddhists, the Muslims, and the Hindus, they're that now. Even the Christians, they have to eventually come through Christ. Christians have to eventually come through the real Christ, not the pop icon Jesus with the flowing long hair, the blue eyes, very handsome, the well-kept beard. Yeah. So my claim, my insistence, my my belief based on scripture is that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Oh, that's so exclusive, Martin. No, it's not, because everybody eventually comes through that channel. That's it. Muslims will someday no longer be Muslims. Christians, thank God, will someday no longer be Christians. They will discover Jesus Christ. Everybody comes through that channel. That's where my belief differs from the standard issue Christian belief that oh, they will say Jesus Christ is the channel. They are correct in that, but their whole conclusion uh, that follows from that premise is wrong because they believe that uh, who saved those four and no more they're saved everybody else goes to hell for eternity because they're not smart enough to choose jesus now, jesus is the savior of all humanity especially those who believe now first timothy 4 10 so what's another false teaching that will disqualify anyone from believing paul's gospel because, look, I just told you everybody's going to be saved. Eventually, they're all going to come through Christ. That's right. Uh, God is the Savior of all humanity, 1 Timothy 4.10. But he's the Savior of all humanity, especially of believers. Now, I know this. a lot of you have heard all this before, but I have a feeling I'm going to say something just a little different that's going to make, you, it's going to make it pop, pop, pop for you, and you're going to believe it even more. But it is essential for me to give this message to those who have never heard it. It's not just for... My, the sake of my contemporary listeners and viewers, but for those who will be around after we are snatched away because of Paul's evangel, because we believe in the death, the entombment, and the resurrection of Christ. We don't believe the Trinity because we believe Christ died. That's foundational to a belief in Paul's gospel. 
We're not going to be here. The snatching away is imminent. Jesus Christ is coming back for his body. This is not the call to Israel. And the snatching away of the body of Christ has nothing to do with the constellation of Revelation 12 that's going to exist on September 23rd, 2017. That has to do with something, and I'm going to tell you what. But it doesn't have to do with the body of Christ. This is related to Israel. However, there is a verse which I call a Rosetta Stone verse that relates our activity, that is our snatching away to God, with an event in Israel. I call it the Rosetta Stone verse. Of course, the Rosetta Stone being the, the famous hieroglyphic that enabled um, archaeologists and linguists around the world to translate uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics. It was a key, if you will, as like a map. Like, you know, this little picnic table equals a rest stop. Okay? Now, what else is keeping people from believing this evangel, this gospel of Paul's that will give him, give them an especially salvation? Because that's the rest of that verse that I mentioned, 1 Timothy 4.10, God is the Savior of all humanity, especially of believers. What does it take to be a believer? What does it take? It, it takes God calling you from before you were born. And if he has called you, if he has pre-selected you, then you will believe the truth and not lies. The truth belongs to being pre-selected. So it's not the fact that, oh, Martin says people are saved if they believe the right thing. No. You're putting the cart before the horse there. You're putting the egg before the chicken. This is what I like to say. I like to say that if you're chosen beforehand, you will sometime during your life come into a realization of the truth, not the lies, the truth. If you never do get to a realization of the truth and you continue to believe in satanic teachings like the Trinity or human free will, then it's simply evidence that you have not been chosen beforehand. That instead, you've been chosen to be a member of the world's most popular religion. And you'll go to the great white throne. You'll miss the thousand years. You won't be working with God and Christ to reconcile the universe to him, but that's okay. That's not your calling. You will appear at the great white throne, at which time you will be judged in accord with your acts. And if you've been a decent person, help some old ladies across the street, and sold Girl Scout cookies, then you will proceed to the new earth, and you will survive there by eating the leaves of the log of life that grows be, uh, next to the river of life in the New Jerusalem. Not a bad way to go. That eon probably lasts 10,000 years. You're going to be a happy camper living on that uh, earth. Uh, it's true, you're not going to be snatched away to heaven. You're not going to be ruling and reigning with Christ. But, hey, that's not for everybody. It's for us special people. Ha <laughs> ha. And I know everybody goes, oh, how can you say that, Martin? I'm special because God chose me. That's it. It's just the pleasure of God. It's not fair. No, it's not fair. I had nothing to do with it. That's where when you find out that you're actually called, when you find out that God has actually done this apart from your behavior, you're like, oh my God, that's the most amazing thing I've ever heard. I could have missed it. Yes, you could have missed it. You realize it's purely God's choice. Then you really freak out and say, God, it really doesn't depend on my behavior. Hey, way to wake up and smell the coffee of predetermined, especially salvation. Everyone's been predetermined to spend eternity with God. That's, not, that's a given. Everybody's going to spend eternity with God. But not everybody is going to rule and reign with Christ among the celestials for two glorious eons preceding the consummation when death is abolished and everyone gets life with God. At the consummation, when death is abolished, every human ever born comes into an eternity of life with God. Yeah, that's my message. It's great news for everybody. But I got extra special news for people who believe a special evangel. And all I do is put it out there. I just say it. I announce it. And that gives God an, quote, opportunity. He, just, he wants to use human beings. He likes it. He could just do this all himself without any assistance whatsoever. But he, he likes to put people in important roles to herald this word because um, he, likes to, he likes to give people, human beings, like extra special little bonuses. Yeah, I like that idea. Uh, I find myself in that position, and now you're in that position. Free will, what's so horrible about it? Oh, I don't know, just this, that it blows up the truth that Christ died for your sins. Many of you have heard me say this before. I'm going to say it again for those who have never heard it, and I probably won't say it again for the duration of this series. 
Jesus Christ, according to Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4, died for our sins. He didn't just die. There's an important part there people don't get. People always talk about the death, entombment, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The death, entombment, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yeah, great, you forgot one important part. The death for our sins. He did something. He died for a reason, for a purpose, and that is to eliminate our misses, our sins, so that we can enjoy eternal life with him apart from failure, apart from missing the mark. Free will, the human teaching, the demonic teaching of human free will states that upon your birth, your default setting is you are a sinner bound for hell. That's your destiny. And sometime during your life, you better make a decision to believe in Jesus Christ because if you don't, your sins will remain and you will go to hell for eternity. Your sins will remain. Now, th this is what, what when you're born. So you're, you're born, you're not even on, well, you're sort of on probation, but your default setting is you're a sinner doomed for hell. And isn't that what all the Christian tracts say? Sure they do. This is what you learn when you become an evangelist in the Christian institution. First thing you got to do is convict them of their sin. Convict them of their sin. Tell them that they are a worthless, wretched sinner bound for hell. Oh my God, this is 2,000 years subsequent to the death of Jesus Christ for sin? <laughs> Why is sin still a problem? We're, we're 2,000 years subsequent to the death of Christ for sin. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, Paul says. I believe in 1 Timothy 1.15. Uh, but apparently it didn't work because when I'm born 2,000 years subsequent to Christ's work on behalf, on my behalf for sin, I'm still going to hell because of sin. Hmm, what did Jesus Christ do? Absolutely freaking nothing. Nothing. If you believe the standard issue Christian call to evangelism. You're a sinner going to hell. That's how you start this life. And how do you get out of it? Oh, they'll be happy to tell you. You come down to the altar on Wednesday night and you say the sinner's prayer. And every religion, every sect of Christianity has a different sinner's prayer. But you better say it right. You better get the adjectives, the syllables, the vowels, and then and, uh, the, the consonants in the right order, or you won't be saved. you got to be baptized too, or your sins may still stand against you. And you have to be baptized in the right way. Some believe you need to be immersed. Some believe you need to be sprinkled. Uh, what a ugly mess of confusion that Satan has inspired. The simple truth is this. You don't have a free will. You have a will, it's just not free. A free will is uninfluenced by anything. The fact is that Jesus Christ died four years sins, 2,000 years before you were born. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why everybody, that's why I know everybody's going to be with God for eternity because Jesus Christ took away sin. That's right. It's done deal for everybody. God's conciliated to the world. Even when you're born, he's conciliated to you. He's at peace. That's my message. Ooh, that's different than the mainstream Christian message. Yeah, it is. It's different to say that you're saved. Now, I don't know who has Aeonian life. That's the difference. I know everybody's going to be with God for eternity. That's my message. But I also have a message that brings you in early, gives you the backstage pass to the big show, and you get to work with God as a special friend of his for two eons before the time when all humanity comes in. It's an early call. It's an early salvation. It's an especially salvation. I didn't invent that phrase. It's from 1 Timothy 4.10, and it reads that way in any version. Therefore, the doctrine of human free will cleverly, cleverly, this is a satanic teaching, cleverly gets many millions and millions of people who think they believe that they're saved by Jesus, it gets millions of people to say, yes, my salvation is of Christ. But what they really believe is that they're saved by their decision to believe in Christ. Ooh, that's a subtle twist. That's a satanic twist. And you have to slow down the film to see the sleight of hand that says, of course you're saved by Jesus Christ. But when you push and get right down to it, ask a couple pertinent questions, you find out these people really don't believe that. If they were saved by Jesus Christ, then why weren't they saved when they were born? Because Jesus Christ had already died for sin. Good question, right? Ask them that sometime. And you will get them to admit, if they're honest, I guess I really wasn't saved by Jesus Christ. I was saved by my decision to believe in Jesus Christ. I'm not saying that belief is not important, but even that is a gift of God, 
Romans 12, 3, Philippians 1, 29. It's been graciously granted you to believe in God. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Grace out of faith, and this is not out of you. The faith is not out of you. It's a gift. It's a gorgeous, generous, juicy gift given to those whom God has chosen beforehand to become co-laborers with him in the completion of the eras or the completion of the eons. That is to bring all creation, not only the human creation, but the celestial creation back to himself. That's our calling. I would love for you to believe it. In order to do that, you have to unhand the diabolical teaching of the Trinity. You must unhand the diabolical uh, doctrine of human free will, which says that you become the ultimate decider of your eternal destiny. You, not Jesus. But then you whitewash it and say, yes, Jesus did it. No, that's BS, you see. And believing in eternal torment isn't too hot either. My friend Aaron Welch says when Paul says Jesus Christ died for our sins, the hour includes not only him and his fellow believers, but all. And this salvation, once you grasp it, once you grasp the grace of God, you realize there's nothing stopping it from applying to everybody. And when you read passages like Romans 5, 18 and 19, 1 Timothy 4, 10, which I've been repeating repeatedly on this particular program, and uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 21, Ephesians 1, 10, Philippians 2, 10, you realize that Romans 11, 36, Romans 11, 32, you realize that this salvation is eventually for everyone, for everyone eventually. But for now, it's for us. We have, we have a prior expectation, Ephesians chapter 1. We have a prior expectation in Christ because of this message that I'm heralding to you today, the death for our sins, the entombment, and the resurrection from death of Jesus Christ. Grasp onto this, and you will grasp onto it if you've been appointed before the disruption of the world to do so. I'm merely a messenger. I'm putting the truth out there for you to believe it. Believe it and enter into Aeonian life, which is a life pre-expectant for members of the body of Christ, given us by our resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ. God is the savior of all savior. He's the savior of all humanity, but especially of you and of me.